accused of wrongdoing. It doesn't ask for judicial review of the crime in question before starting or finishing deportation proceedings. In other words, I don't get to go up before a judge. And it doesn't acknowledge these little things that some of us used to have a long time ago. These little things called rights. Right? So police state pretty much does away with those three. And those three, right? Political rights, habeas corpus, judicial review, they are in some way the things that we use in order to confirm and reinforce the fact that we're human and that we're fallible and that we can make mistakes. That judges can make mistakes, that police officers can make mistakes, that immigration officials can make mistakes, that our neighbors can make mistakes when they're guessing whether or not we've done something wrong or not. Right? So, in a way, I mean, this is really what the Obama administration is urging on, upon us, is to cooperate with federal authorities right, in order to continue to reinforce a police state. Now, it seems to me that if the objective at hand is a safer community, right, at least for me, I don't know about you, but a safer community is a community in which I feel I can trust my neighbors, my colleagues, my friends. The way I build trust is to know that if I approach someone to report a crime or ask for help because something, some injustice was done to me, then I won't be thrown in jail. But essentially, this is what Secure Communities is asking, right? That if you are an undocumented migrant, or if you're basically, it doesn't matter, right? We don't actually know. It's, if you're brown, if you look like you don't belong here, then you get to be thrown in jail and possibly vulnerable to being deported. So if I want to build trust, then it seems to me that what I really want right, is to know my neighbors, to be able to talk to them, to know that if I approach them, I can, that if I'm a witness to a crime, that I can actually contribute, participate towards being a good neighbor without actually being penalized on it. Now, the other irony of this Secure Communities Bill, mind you again, it's imposed upon us by the Department of Homeland Security, urged on by the Obama administration, is these are groups presumably, right, democracy, groups supposed to, supposedly representing us. It's that they're urging us to turn on, turn in neighbors who don't quite look like us, who seem to be different, who seem to be from away. Right? Really quite a primitive impulse. It's not a bill that represents us, but rather it's a bill that urges us to turn on one another so the politicians can capitalize on our fear and xenophobic impulses in order to continually be reelected to office. So secure communities, this bill in fact, leads to insecure, unsafe, violent, and hostile communities. It renders it a, a police state and an insecure community. So that's all I want to say for the moment. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Hasmi Torrejon, and I am one of the lead organizers from the Justice for Jason campaign. There are some other of the lead organizers here tonight as well, so hey guys. And <laughs> um, right now, uh, so I've started doing most of my community organizing through the Justice for Jason campaign, and right now I'm also continuing to do community organizing at a different level in the north end of Springfield. Um, through an organization called the North End Organizing Network. And so I'm really, I, I just came from work and I'm really excited about we're about to launch a campaign to start organizing in this community. And there hasn't been organizing for like over 50 years, so I'm really amped. Um, but I want to talk to you about a little bit of J4J &J, um, and also let you know why I'm here today. And the reason why is because I believe this ordinance is a way to challenge the systematic inequality in our quote unquote, justice system. And in the Justice for Jason campaign, I and the other organizers really were in a battle with this justice system to help and support Jason be able to have his life back. And I know some, the majority of you probably know about Jason's case, but I'll try and give 
a brief overview. On February 3rd of 2008, Jason Vassell, who is, was a black student majoring in biology, and I think he had one more semester left before graduating, was in his dorm when two white men who were not students um, threatened him, yelled racial invective to him, and essentially started a racially motivated attack. In response to this attack, Jason defended himself with a pocket knife, injuring his assailants. Now, an important fact to know is that while these assailants, after they got injured, they still decided to come back towards Jason and tell him to finish the fight because they wanted, they wanted to instigate this violence. And I think that's a very important thing to point out from the beginning. As a result, the person who was charged, despite being in his, his home, you know, even though it's a dormitory room, that's his home, he was charged and the other two white men were basically given a slap on the wrist. And he wasn't charged with just some, you know, a little basic misdemeanor. He was charged with two Class A felonies that could have resulted in 30 years in prison if he was convicted of it. So here you have, to paint an even deeper picture, Jason himself was a man that didn't have even a scratch mark on his record. And two white men who had an extensive record of racially motivated attacks. The black man, guilty until proven innocent, the two white men with extensive histories. Oh, it's okay, guys. You know, you, you made a mistake. That's okay. You know, you were drunk. That's fine. Slap on the wrist. Go back and do your duty. So, you know, it was very shocking to a lot of members in this community when this case was brought out because, you know, this is a progressive town. You know, we, we, see, we want to believe that in this community, there's better because we, as the constituents, believe in a better community for ourselves. But this justice system proved to us that we are not too far apart from what's happening nationally. And to, I think something else that brings this picture to even a bigger light is that whether or not you, you, know, you question Jason's actions or you found nothing wrong with how Jason responded to this racist attack, the bigger picture is how Jason was approached by the prosecution and how these two other white men were approached. And why were they approached so differently? Why was one guilty immediately and why were the other two not? And so throughout the Justice for Jason campaign and with support of the legal defense team, we tried to prove that there was a selective prosecution happening in our community based on Jason's race. And through this process, we were able to get some data uh, from the prosecution's office. It wasn't too detailed, um, and it actually revealed a lot of areas where the police department and the prosecutor's office could be doing a better job of reporting on who's being charged and with what. Um, but despite that, some of the numbers that we got show that in this community, we are still charging people of color at much higher rates than their white counterparts. And to give you a sense of some of those numbers, and once again, these aren't fully accurate because we didn't get all of the records, but one data shows that in the district courts, um, blacks were charged 9.02 times at the rate of their white counterparts. And in the superior courts, black or African Americans were charged at 12.99 and 21.87 times their white counterparts. Uh, and this is in this community. This Ham Hampshire County uh, includes Northampton and I think all the way to Amherst and some other of the smaller towns. I don't think that it, this is not a big booming city with people of color. So how, where are these people of color coming from and, where, and how are they being charged so much more than this great majority of white folks? <laughs> um, so the question I have for myself and for you is why is this? Why is it that this injustice happened to Jason and why is it that it is normalized in, every, in our everyday life in this justice system, locally and nationally. And it's clear that, you know, the reason why I started with the justice system is because it's clear it's not a justice system, it's an unjust system. And we need to do something in order to change that. And sure, you know, I could ramble and say, man, this system sucks, that's not gonna change anything. <laughs> I could say, we need to turn this system upside down and create something from the grassroots level, and yes, I believe in that and I will fight so the day I die for that, but it's not gonna happen, you know, immediately. It's not gonna say I'm gonna do this and then all of a sudden tomorrow we have this perfect system. 
But one of the reasons why I believe in what's happening here with this forum and with this ordinance is because we're taking a step towards that bigger movement. And we're trying to show that in Northampton, we can start to create a system in a community where there is true justice. And that we can begin to mirror that in the nation so that they can see what a community looks like when there is a system of justice and how that impacts the community. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit excited again. So. <laughs> um, I think one of the other main points to this ordinance and to something that we always have to do in that Injustice for Jason was really a key thing is to hold our elected officials accountable. And in this case, um, I guess the prosecutor, the, the prosecutor's office or the DA's office is the first place to start. During Jason's case, the main person we targeted was the district attorney, Elizabeth Scheibel, who decided to bring these charges unfairly. Right now we have a new DA, but that doesn't mean he's a better person. And I don't even know if he's in this room. He should be in this room. Um, but we need to hold them accountable because they make promises and we have to hold them accountable to those promises. Otherwise, they stay in their office, they get their paycheck, and people get charged however they want them to get charged, and no one has a say in whether or not that's a fair thing to do or that they did it fairly. So in the ordinance, I think you got, um, the AFSC group is probably going to get into more detail about the different things they're asking, but I think we have to realize why accountability is important, and it doesn't just mean that the DA says, yes, I'm doing a great job, but show us that you're doing a great job. Give us the reports. Give us deeper, deeper reports than the ones that they gave us at Justice for Jason's discovery. Show us all the data. If you can't show us all the data, that means that you are not proud of the work that you're doing and you're afraid that you've been doing something wrong. So um, I'm going to move from that point. I think I've nailed it down a little couple of times and <laughs> brought it to the floor. <laughs> um, but you know, I think we should envision this community and see it as a step in the right direction and see this ordinance as leading by example. And Northampton is a great community. I live here and I love it, but it's not in as bad conditions as communities like Springfield or in communities in the Midwest where racist prosecutions happen normally every day. And so I think we have to bear that in mind, but also be proud of the work that we're doing and hope that this catches on to those communities so that we can spread and we can continue building. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Good evening. Is this on? Nope. Someone going to help? Ah. Uh, high tech, the button. I I'm Bill Newman. I run the Western Massachusetts Legal Office of the American Civil Liberties Union. And I was asked to talk tonight about sur local surveillance. Let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. We've had some community forums on this. I'm not going to talk about federal wiretaps and sneak and peek provisions and national security letters and Patriot Act provisions and warrantless wiretapping and border searches and the TSA and a lot of other things that you should most assuredly be worried about. But we're going to worry about something else that you should also be worried about. And I want to break this little talk down into two parts, what we know and what we don't know. First of all, the, what the feds are doing is critically important. Some can get into your computer without a warrant. Someone can search your personal papers and all your bank records through a uh, letter sent out from the Department of Justice without, without any judicial oversight whatsoever. You should be concerned about that. But most law enforcement and most law enforcement dollars actually are spent and happen at the local level. About 90% of it nationwide or more. So let me tell you what we have done to try to find out about surveillance at the local level. On November 4th last year, on behalf of the ACLU, I sent a public records request, that's the state version of the Freedom of Information Act request, and I sent it to the Western Massachusetts Homeland Security Advisory Council. That is part of the Franklin Regional County of Governments, what they call the COG. And the COG, the Western Massachusetts Homeland Security, which is part of the COG, that includes the four western counties, Hampshire and Hamden, Franklin and Berkshire, that COG is the, literally the COG, that distributes homeland security money in Western Massachusetts. 
So I said.